Let's open our Bibles again there to John 19, 17, as we continue verse by verse through John's Gospel. We finished last week in verse 16 with just simply the words they, that Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified and they led him away. So this morning we would like to begin a series of studies just thinking about the cross. We are told in Matthew that as Jesus was led away, right before Pilate's soldiers again took and they further abused the Lord, and that it was six o'clock in the morning and he would be crucified at nine, so three hours somehow passed by all of those things. But now we come to this epic event, holy ground, I think, you know, the, the, the crucifixion of our Lord, the place of where, where, where we are redeemed from, from our sins by God's plan. John is very short on details. In fact, if you look at verse 17, he literally covers the crucifixion in one verse. The other Gospels give us much to go on. I want to just share a couple of things from those with you this morning. John's interest is very specific. <clears throat> he wants you to read his Gospel and conclude Jesus is God, that, that you find that everywhere. He fulfills the Scriptures. He's in charge of even of his own death, and that by believing in him, you'll find eternal life. That's certainly God's will as well. And John wrote this book, 40 years after everything was already in circulation to a third generation of folks who needed to hear who Jesus was and probably weren't around m many of them when he came to save them. So that's what we want to focus on for the next few weeks. You know, the crucifixion from the worldly standpoint was the death of a would-be king, an upstart, someone who, you know, drew a lot of attention and yet the religious folks and their abilities to get rid of him and the Romans and their power to dispose of him, you know, it ended up on a cross. But from God's point of view and from John's, this was the execution of the king of kings, but it was his idea. He had come to die. He would rise again. He would save those who look to him. And so over the next few minutes, a uh, few minutes, few weeks, we want to look at this ultimate sacrifice. <clears throat> Growing up as a Catholic I was used to a crucifix. How many of you know what that is? Right? Jesus on the cross. And, and it was everywhere. It was in our school rooms at school. It was in the hallway. It was in the gymnasium. Uh, over my bed, as long as I can remember living at home, there was a, a crucifix. And my mom would often point to it and said, Now, you see, God loves you. And I would kind of look and go, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. But it was everywhere around me. And, and, and even in the culture today, I was thinking about the last week or so, you, you see crosses everywhere from cathedrals to cemeteries. You know, you, you find them on tattoos and jewelry hanging around people's necks. It, it is pretty much a symbol of, of what Jesus came to do. But because of the familiarity in so many ways and, and the lack of understanding, it certainly loses its impact. Right? I mean, people will wear it and they have no clue. That just looks good with this outfit. Really? You don't wear an electric chair, you know. But yet that's what it stood for, a death. So I want to be sure that at least going in that we don't approach, you know, what we're going to study and miss the purpose of it as well. Because unfortunately, we're around it all the time as Christians. We have communion and we talk about Jesus' death. And we, we open the Bible and we talk about him being born to die. Whether it's Christmas or Easter, there's always a cross. And it's really easy for it to just kind of get dull. But, but if you read these accounts and think to yourself, this was done for me. If no one else had believed but you, the Lord would have done this for you. It's personal. Then I think that you walk away not only appreciative of what the Lord has done for you, which is why we have communion, to remind us constantly, but I think you'll be more than willing to, to risk a little, you know, flack to share with others who he is. I, I told you a story a few years ago, but it bears repeating, at least in this context of a, of a fellow that I'd read about who lived on a farm in the middle of nowhere, really, and he had a dirt road go by his house, and so uh, his eight-year-old boy was playing on his bike one day when a guy recklessly driving down the the road hit and killed his son. And it, it devastated his father. He had two boys. One was 12, one was 8, and this boy was instantly killed. And so the next day when the 12-year-old boy came out to the barn to go to work, he found the mangled bike of his 8-year-old brother hanging on the barn door. And he said, Dad, what's this doing here? He said, I never want to forget your brother. And he said, to this day I never have. I cry every day when I walk out here. That wouldn't be such a bad response from you and I when we get to Calvary. I know it's really easy to just go, yeah, I read it all the time. But it's more than that, isn't it? 
I think it was Oswald Chambers who wrote, Heaven is interested in the cross. Hell is terrified by it. Only man is able to more or less ignore it altogether. Well, we don't want that for our lives. So I'm hoping that as we go, and we'll try to go slowly through it, we might just ask the Lord to make this real to us because it is an awesome price to pay for the likes of us, don't you think? And yet he did. Verse 17 says this. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. <clears throat> Death by crucifixion was begun by the Persians. They superstitiously believed that the earth was sacred, and as such, if you were you know, a person who had committed a crime against it somehow, when you died, your feet shouldn't be touching it. But the Romans had perfected crucifixion, and, and you should know, and you can look at historical reports, it was a horrific, brutal way to die. In fact, if you were crucified, you would hang for three or four or five days on a cross. And, and what your diaphragm could do early on in, in breathing for you and allowing you to exhale, eventually it just paralyzed, it gave out, and then you would be forced to pull up on, on your arms, which are now, you know, through the bone here, hung on a cross. You'd have to pull yourself up just to exhale, to be able to, to let air out. Most everyone who died on a cross, unless they bled to death, died of a, a asphyxiation. They suffocated. Uh, they actually put the feet thing up underneath the person being crucified to prolong their death. They could now push up off their feet a little bit. But before, if you were hanging, and just it would just, you know, you slowly, but you'd be breathing more and more shallow. It was a horrible a way to die. The Romans never crucified their citizens. They, they reserved this kind of death for the worst of offenders. And they really had, uh, historically, two ways to crucify people. On a vertical stake, uh, it was called a crux simplex. It was, you know, hands overhead, nailed to this one beam, and then your feet on the other. And, and then, as they became more sophisticated, they, they started to put a vertical stake across. It would keep people alive a little longer. It was called uh, the patibulum. It was you know, a cross beam. It weighed 75 or maybe 100 pounds. It was probably what Jesus carried when he went to Calvary. The, the stake was probably already in the ground. This was just the cross beam, if you will. So um, that's what we think Jesus was crucified from. Now, when the Lord left the Antonio Fortress, that Roman encampment on the Temple Mount area, um, Matthew tells us that Jesus carried his uh, cross as far as the, the city gate. I think Matthew 27, maybe verse 32. So he, that's as far as he could go. It was 100 pounds. It was on his back. He'd been beaten and bled and, and scourged and up all night. And, it, you know, there, that's all the strength that, that he had left. And the soldiers were not allowed to, if possible, have these people die in the streets. They, they had to um, get them on the cross. They had to let people know that Rome was in charge. This is the way it was. So we read in the other Gospels that Jesus coming out of the city the, the soldiers, the four of them, got him some help by a guy named Siren, uh, Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene is near Tripoli in Libya. It would have been 800 miles away. And apparently he had just gotten in town for the Passover. There were a lot of Jews from Cyrene that came, was on the main trade route. In fact, if you get to the book of Acts, you'll see that the Cyrenians had their own synagogues in town. So this was a guy at least going to a place where people spoke his language, maybe ate the foods that he was used to. He could very well have been here for the first time because this was a trek of a lifetime to come for Passover, especially so far. He'd spent a lot of money to get here. And I, and I just envision this guy just being so upset. <laughs> he gets to town. He can't wait to go in and look at the, the synagogue. And some soldier grabs him and goes, yeah, you carry this 100-pound log and follow this guy. We're going to kill him. And you're kind of compelled to help. Uh, by Roman law, any Jew could be compelled to go a mile. The Jews hated the law. It was a visible and, and physical you know, evidence that they were a people under subjection. So Simon would have felt disgraced. Why me? Look, I'm just in, I don't even live here. But he was compelled. Now, what Simon resented and hated, and oh my gosh, I'm in a death march, would eventually turn to the salvation of he and his entire family. Walking behind Jesus, I don't know what he saw. <laughs> I don't know how he, how he viewed it. But I do know that as you continue to read, like in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 15, Mark writes that, that Simon the Cyrenian, who's the father of Alexander and Rufus, and all of a sudden the church goes, hey, we know who his kids are by name? Well, yeah, we do. We know who they are. 
And, and these are the two names that we have of them. And, and Simon came around to believe and, into, and to know the Lord. In fact, uh, in Romans chapter 16, Paul greets his wife in Rome. So what started off as an embarrassment and, and maybe a humiliation um, turned out for Simon to be salvation. And that's usually the way it is. You know, the cross will embarrass you. It'll humiliate you. I'm a sinner. I need help. <laughs> I got to get on my face. I got to go down and believe. I got to pray and ask. But ultimately, God then gives life. In fact, if you go to Acts chapter 11, 12, and 13, but especially 11 and 13, I think, you will find a bunch of Cyrenian saints on the, on the leadership group of the church at Antioch that began to send uh, people out into the mission field, beginning with Paul and Barnabas. So God had a great work amongst these folks Simon being one of them. But he's one of the fellows that John, John just sends us to the cross. But they're one of the fellows that, that we are told about that, that was faced with the cross of Jesus and came to know him. And I want to give you three things to think about. The cross, the company, and the coronation. You can remember those three words. And I think that you should take this message and take notes and share it with your friends. Because it in involves everything. The cross <laughs> and believing in Jesus being God. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Simon, who had gone on a polyg uh, religious pilgrimage, came out of it being sold out to Jesus. <laughs> and God will use any situation to draw you to himself, that I'm sure of. Now, we read that Jesus bore his cross here, or went out bearing his cross, present tense. You know, the Roman practice of crucifixion meant that they would take the prisoner through as many streets of the city as possible to expose what could happen to you if you began to rub Rome the wrong way. So this was more than just killing a guy for what they believed was a capital offense. This was propaganda to say we are in control here completely. And when that processional was finished, they would usually crucify criminals in the most conspicuous place as a deterrent. In fact, we will read in verse 20 that many of the Jews read the title over Jesus' cross because he was put in a very conspicuous place. Now, we are told usually it was up on the hill. It doesn't have to be. It can be right on the crossroads as well. It was usually in the place the most people saw it for the exact same purpose. Um, but he was taken through the streets, and it was extremely crowded, hundreds of thousands of people in town because of the Passover. We are also told, not by John, but by Luke, that as he went, there was a large crowd that followed him, that loved him, weeping, and especially the ladies of Jerusalem, who just had come to know him, had ministered to him, and, and they were just weeping as he went. And I don't think this processional was quick. It would have been a very difficult road to follow. If you've been up and down the streets in Jerusalem, it is not an easy place to walk now, and things haven't changed much. But in the midst of that, that walk, the, Luke tells us that Jesus stopped and he turned to these ladies and he said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself. Weep for your children. The days are coming when they're going to say to you, Blessed are those who have not borne children and whose breasts have not nursed them. On the day when they will begin to cry out to the mountains, Fall upon us and cover us. And then Jesus said, Look what they're doing in the green wood. What will they do in the dry? In other words, I'm with them and look how they're responding. What happens when I'm gone? And the Lord spoke about this coming slaughter. In fact, this coming time when there would be a, a, a tremendous overflow and, and overthrow in the city. Don't cry for me. My future is bright, but it isn't so bright for my people. They've set me aside. They've, they, they've, they've decided that this is the road that they should go. Forty years later, less than 40 years, the Roman 10th Legion under Titus will, will roll into Jerusalem and, and literally hundreds of thousands of people will be massacred. And the Jews will run in every direction and lose their homeland until 1948. It was a, an unbelievable slaughter. Jesus wept over the city the week before. If you would have just known in your day that I would have gathered you as a, as a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not. And, and now you, you, you look forward to this destruction. And it was really the judgment of God that would fall upon the nation. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian in, in, in his Jewish Wars books. And you can get them. They're not so easy to read, but it's there. In, in books 5 and 6, record the gory details. So Jesus talked about this national calamity to come when they would cry out, oh, may the mountains hide us and the hills cover us. Now, if you know your Bible, back in, in the book of Hosea, chapter 10, written about 740 B.C., the people that were facing an Assyrian overthrow cried out those very same things. 
They were being judged by God after years of being told to repent and turn back to the Lord, and they had not. But there's another time that we'll read of it, not just here, where Jesus said, you're on the precipice again of judgment because you've set me aside, but in the book of Revelation in chapter 6, when the church is taken out and the, and the wrath of God begins to fall, you'll read in Revelation chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, that the people begin to cry out on the earth to the, to the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne, the wrath of the, man, of the Lamb, for the day of his great wrath has come, who's able to stand? And so Jesus takes, on the way to the cross, a very well-known, um, if you will, prophecy, and he applies it for the second time to a nation that's turning away from him and will yet apply it to a world that wants nothing to do with him. All the while headed for the cross to save us. It's a good thing we've been delivered from his wrath, isn't it? I think it's, what is the passage? 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, we've been delivered from the wrath of God. He didn't appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation. Well, Mark, uh, sorry, John tells us that they finally came to the place of crucifixion, the place of a skull. In Hebrew, it is called Golgotha. But skulls are pretty ugly, aren't they? I mean, everybody uses them to speak about death. Or, or by the way, the number one tattoo, skulls. If you get a skull, you go, hey, look at my unique skull. It's not very unique. Everybody's got one. But Golgotha is a Hebrew word for an Aramaic word that just means skull in Latin. They called it calvarium. In um, Greek, they call it cranian. <laughs> I think we get the picture, right? Today, Calvary for us represents that place where Jesus came to give his life for the sins of the world and for us. If you go to Israel today, we take our group there. For already several hundred years in the rock formation near the base of Mount Calvary, there is a, a distinct vision and view of a skull. But whether it was named for that or not is hard to tell. It was definitely named for the place of death. Now, you might remember back in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham was a man of 100 years old, and um, actually 125 almost. His son was 25 years old when God had not spoken to him since he was born, I, I, his son Isaac. And the Lord one day woke him up and said, Hey, why don't you take your son Isaac to a mountain that I will show you, and I want you to offer him to me as a sacrifice. And and Abraham, with 125 years of faith experience, didn't hesitate. He had a promise from God that through this son, he would have children and heirs and grandchildren and a nation. And his boy wasn't even married. And the New Testament mentions that Abraham's action was of faith. He, he believed, and he, without a doubt, that God could raise the dead rather than fail a promise. <laughs> so he took this boy, packed up the bags, you know, got on the donkeys, and off, took the servants, and off they went. And for three days... Abraham viewed his boy as dead. His only son is what the Lord called him. By the time that they got to Mount Moriah, which is a, the mountain upon which Calvary has its highest shoulder, Isaac, not a dumb kid, went, I see fire, I see wood, I see no sacrifice, what's going on here? To which his dad replied, yeah, I was meaning to get to that. No, what he said was this, Lord, son, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. And you know the story how at the very last moment with a, a knife raised over his son lying upon uh, the, the place of offering, it was the angel of the Lord who cried out, Abraham, Abraham, twice, yes, Lord, here I am. He said, don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. I know that you fear God. You haven't withheld your son, your only son from me. And turning around, he found this ram in the thicket. And, and Abraham called the name of this Mount Moriah area. The Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Years later, David would be on this very spot when he would be facing the wrath of God for numbering the people, and, and he wanted to build a place of worship and a, a place of sacrifice to, to turn God's judgment away. And he bought the threshing floor of a fella. He, he, the fella said, just take it. We don't want to die. David would go, I can't give God what doesn't cost me anything. Paid full price, and he built the altar, and the plague was stayed. It was the same spot. Years later, David's son Solomon came to build the temple, built it on the same spot. And now Jesus comes to die on the same spot because he's the one that's going to die for the sins of the world. So that's, that's what the, 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 the cross represents. For three days as Abraham traveled, he saw his only begotten son as dead. On the third day, the good news, he got him back alive as if risen from the dead. That's the cross. First see. Second see. company, verse 18. Where they crucified Jesus, two others with him, one on either side 
Jesus right there in the center. Now, again, I want you to point out that John uses very few words to talk about the crucifixion. He's interested in recording the fruit of it, and, and that's what we will get to, certainly. But here's an interesting picture. Three crosses, bad guy on either side, Jesus hanging on Barabbas' cross, the ringleader, right? The one who was released in, instead of him. And Isaiah would write prophetically, Isaiah 53, 12, our Messiah will be numbered with the transgressors. Two dying for their own sins, Jesus in their midst dying for all of ours. We are told in the other Gospels, and especially in Luke, that as this crucifixion began, that the people sat down. In fact, Matthew, I think, 27, 36, he says, the people sat down and watched. I don't get that. <laughs> I want as far away from this as possible, but I guess the way people are attracted to horrific accidents, the people just, you know, they, they, they sat around to watch. As the crucifixion was taking place, everyone came by to taunt Jesus. The crowds did. If you're the Son of God, come down from there. We'll believe you. The religious leaders did. The soldiers did. All of them pretty much said the same thing. Show us who you are, big shot, now that you're crucified. And the Lord took it all, every single criticism, because if he comes down, we don't live. <laughs> he stays up there. We have hope, don't we? Well, he was crucified with a couple of criminals. Mark calls them robbers, murderers. John just says Jesus was in the middle. So you have the crowds yelling, the rulers yelling, even the soldiers yelling, these convicted murderers all crying the same thing. Save yourself. We'll believe in you. But think about that. If Jesus saves himself, we're, we're, we're on the hook. And I'll tell you what, I've heard save yourself before. If you go to Luke 4 and you go with Jesus out into the wilderness for 40 days, tempted of the devil, one of the temptations of the devil that, that we are told about was, was the devil saying to Jesus, look, you can forgo the cross. Just bow down right here. Worship me. Save yourself. Why go through all that house? I'll give you what I have, and I have the kingdoms of this world. I'll let you have those. And Jesus turned away from him because that's a satanic suggestion, and a lot of people do it. They figure they can go to heaven without Jesus. I don't need to go to Calvary. I don't need to go to the cross. He didn't die for me. It's not important to me. Well, guess what? If, he, if you don't have him with you the day you stand before God, you're in big trouble. Because that's always been a lie of the enemy, right? The deception is always try to make it without him. So the priests call upon him to meet their requirements, and then they'll believe, and the crowd just follows each other, and there's a lot of those. And the soldiers, they seem to be in power, and they're stronger than everyone else, and the thieves are in the same predicament as he was, and so concluded, <laughs> what good is he to us? He dies like we do. But in the midst of all of that negativity and deception and screaming, there is one thief who's been watching this go on, and God is speaking to his heart, and he's listening. And he concludes that there's something wrong here. In fact, one of the criminals, according to Luke, who were being hanged with him there on the cross, said to the other one, do you not even so much as fear God? Seeing we're under the same condemnation, we indeed are justly here. We are receiving the due reward for our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. What a sane voice in the midst of chaos. He turned to Jesus as best as he was able and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into the kingdom, into your kingdom. And Jesus said, surely today. Today you will be with me in paradise. It's in a marvelous picture. And Luke is the only one who gives us the conversation and it is Jesus' second word from the cross after Father forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But I don't think it's any coincidence that John, in, in giving us the rest of the picture, says Jesus was right in between these two guys. One on the left and one on the right. Because what you are given by God there at Calvary is a pretty good sampling of how things work in the world. You know? It, it's a pretty good picture of human nature's response to Jesus and his claims. Here were two guys equally close to death and equally far away from the Savior. I mean, it's a pretty good positioning, right? They both hear the same things. They both experience the same feelings. They're both as guilty as they possibly can be. They're both going to die in the next day or two. They have every reason to pay attention now. They are both in the same place. And one dies railing at Jesus, and the other one says, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
One leaves bitter or dies bitter and one dies better. And it all had to do on how they viewed Jesus. One looked at him with distrust and unbelief. And the other one, I don't know where, came up with faith. Maybe the sign over the cross. Maybe Jesus' you know, his mannerisms, his demeanor. He watched his face. He didn't die like a criminal. He isn't the same as everyone else. Whatever it took, he began to say to himself, this is something different here. Did he have a lot to go on? No, he didn't go to any Bible studies. You know, we don't know. He didn't have any tapes or a marker. But whatever it, it was, God was speaking as he speaks to your heart. And it's just a matter of listening. Was he not speaking to the other guy? Of course he was. <laughs> Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, whosoever will. God is interested in all hearts. From the lips of this thief comes another declaration of Jesus' innocence. A friend of sinners. Ate with tax collectors, allowed prostitutes to get near him so he might give them life. The possessed fell at his feet and surrendered. Kids loved hanging out with him. The brokenhearted he wouldn't despise but he was numbered with the transgressor. And at least one of the transgressors looked up, right? And, and, and when he said what he said, his request to Jesus was immediately met with a promise, which begins with the word assuredly. It's a great word. We've gone over it a lot. It, it says verily, verily in some of your King James versions, or amen, amen in the New American Standard, or, or just assuredly. Or, hey, hey, dude, count on this. I think that's the new modern translation right there. <laughs> hey, dude, count on this. Today, you and me will be together in glory. Today. How awesome is that promise? Now, think about it. When Jesus was on trial, all of those six trials, Pilate, absolutely at the front end of that, declared him innocent, and Jesus quit talking. I'm not saying anything else. I'm innocent. Whatever you're doing now is illegal. All right? He responded very little. The minute he hears someone cry out, help me, he's full of promise. Today, man, we're going to make it. You'll be all right. Count on it. What, the, what, what changed here? It is just the heart of this man to turn to the Lord. And, and if you think about it, his request brought immediate forgiveness and an assurance of life after death. All it took for this murderer to go to heaven was an admission of his sin. We are rightfully dying for what we've done wrong and faith in Jesus and a prayer for help. That's it. Here's the cross, here's the company. <laughs> here's the company he keeps, those who turn to him. He didn't earn salvation, it was given to him. It's not his works. What could he offer to Jesus? He begged for remember, just remember me. <laughs> I'm not like the rest of these guys, I see who you are. He wasn't baptized, it's going to mess up a lot of theology. He didn't take communion. Didn't walk down an aisle, didn't raise his hand, didn't come through ritual or sacrament or wherever else you think you can find life. It would say, gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here's life. When that centurion in Matthew 8 came to Jesus for his servant to be healed, Jesus said, well, let me just come to your house and heal him. He said, no, 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 Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but you should just speak the word in my a servant would be healed because I'm also a man in authority. I have men under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. So, Lord, I, Lord, I know that I have authority over a certain place, but you're, the, you're God. <laughs> All you have to do is just speak the word, and he'll be healed. And, Lord, Jesus responded, I haven't found this kind of faith anywhere in Israel. Uh, it just took trusting him and responding to what you hear. When those two on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 were so upset and Jesus joined them and he said, why the long faces? And they said, well, you, you, you grew up under a rock, haven't been around lately. You know, we had hoped that this Jesus of Nazareth would be the guy, but it's been three days, they killed him. He took their hand, they killed him. Our hope is, is over. To them, the cross was the end of things until Jesus spoke his word to them and it began to burn within them and now the cross became the beginning. For the thief on the cross, it was the beginning. He saw it clearly. He cried out for Jesus to help him. Such a, a beautiful picture of how the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus to you. And even though the world's opinions are flying around you in every corner, and you don't find much of this at the cross, he was drawn to him by faith and hope. And I'll tell you what, he wasn't disappointed, was he? 
Such a beautiful picture of how you can be saved. You can just put it on the list. Acknowledge your sin, come to Jesus by faith, receive his sacrifice as sufficient, and believe in his word. Remember me. Notice he didn't say remember us. He couldn't really pray for the other guy, his cohort. Say, hey, you're going to heaven? Yeah, my parents love going to church. That won't work. Remember me. It's personal, isn't it? For your sins, for your life. Lord, save me. And like I said, Jesus responded immediately with assurance. No matter what his crime was, Jesus offered him complete forgiveness. This is all you need. Remember that. For me, just reading it, I see it as a, a taste of Jesus, or for Jesus, of what his death would accomplish. It's almost like drinking a cup of joy before you drink the cup of bitterness, you know? In a couple of hours at noon, darkness was going to fill the sky. And, and, and the father was going to turn his back on his son as Jesus became sin for us. That was the, the payment, isn't it? Separation of sin. And Jesus will cry out, my God, why have you forsaken me? But before that happens, here's one thief over on this side who's coming in. <laughs> and I think it was a wonderful encouragement to the Lord that, that you know, um, he saw the one come. Deathbed conversions are rare in the Bible. There's a few of them. Don't give up praying for the lost because an hour earlier, this guy was heading in the wrong direction. Don't you give up. My mom got saved six days before she died. Now, she said she was saved for years, but the only person who believed it was her. <laughs> None of us did. But right before she died, the things that she said and shared would, would lead everyone to believe she meant what she said. So... Here's his company. Well, finally, I know we're running late here. The, the coronation, verse 19, Pilate writes a title, and he puts it on the cross. And the title says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews rating this title because he was put in a very public place. It was written in Hebrew and Greek and in Latin. The chief priest complained to Pilate, hey, he, he's not the King of the Jews. He just said he was. Pilate said, well, it's too late. And finally, we find Pilate putting his foot down way too little too late. But... Nonetheless, he declared the very thing that we have to end with, that Jesus is king. If Pilate wanted to annoy the, the, the leaders, he couldn't have picked a better way. Three languages, hundreds of thousands of people in town, everyone reading, it's the king of the Jews. How do you get saved? Jesus got to be your king. In fact, in Romans, uh, no, not Romans, Re Revelation, it's an R word, Revelation chapter 17 and, and I think 19, 16, it says when the Lord comes back, they will declare, here's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So one day every knee is going to bow and they're going to sing that song. The smart move is to do so before the Lord returns because then you can be saved. It's a pretty heavy duty thought, isn't it? Father, we thank you this morning as we sit together that you went to the cross to win a company of believers by declaring that you are our king. And this morning as we sit together, may it not be lost on us that this was a huge sacrifice that you made. And it was, it was done on our behalf, for our sake, because we needed help and because you loved us so. And with all of the, the different parts of the big picture, Lord, that you might drive home in our hearts that we are worth something. Look what you paid for us. If, if, if value is, is based upon what someone was willing to pay, if the marketplace determines value, then we are as valuable as the death of your son. And we're just amazed that you would do that for us. I'll say this to you this morning. If you want to have life, you're going to have to go to Jesus. You're going to have to confess your sin, acknowledge his goodness, allow him to be your Lord. In that moment, at that time, God will come and by his spirit dwell in your heart and assure you of your relationship and your stand with him. He will say what he said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be saved. In the moment you cry, he'll answer. John says in chapter 6, he'll in no wise turn you out. You know the old argument, well, I've done so many rotten things. Yeah, so had this guy. And the lie from everyone else, hey, just forsake the cross and we'll believe you. No, it's the only way that man could be saved. If, you do, if the cross and Jesus' death doesn't figure into your salvation, you're not saved. Because there's no other way. 
This morning you can come and pray with one of the pastors. We'd love to pray with you. Invite Jesus into your heart. Maybe you've been gone from the Lord forever. You need to just come back and walk with him. And today of all days, he brings you to church to have you consider how much he was willing to pay. Come this morning. Come and, and receive life freely given to you, but at a great cost to him. And don't forget the cross. Shall we stand?